they still remember the prayer, and then sooner or later they forgot the prayer, but they still remember the story. And the story was enough for them. And we have two visitors today who are alumni who hold stories for us that otherwise we would forget. Every single day when we walk into this building, right past that quilt, we walk past this. And the person who took those pictures is here. This. This sort of Rorschachy looking thing right here, there's an article in the Three Ring Binder downstairs that shows about seven or eight of them. They're really life size. They were. This was made by a person's body being uh, rubbed down with what turned out to be Crisco. It was the thing, the right viscosity. And then lying on a uh, piece of photographic paper, which exposed to the room light would have turned completely black if you put it in the developer. But because of the, the grease on it, it resisted the developer and gave you these white images like that. So take a look at that three ring binder down there if you want to see the sexier ones. This, this is pretty sexy if you know what you're looking for. <laughs> often something like this and we were both attending a conference and the same event and I don't know if you recall this, it's called uh, fishbowl technique. There are about six or eight people in the center of the room, probably on the floor knee to knee, talking person-centered approach, talking about feelings and so on, some various topics. And the rule was that if the rest of the room was just as silently observing, but if someone on the outside wanted to be on the inside talking group, they would tap someone on the shoulder and trade places so that the makeup of the central talking group was shifting from time to time. And I noticed that whenever Carl came into that central group, something happened. The defenses significantly reduced. People took more risks in sharing their feelings. The conversation got more intriguing. And then when someone tapped Rogers on the shoulder and he left, the defenses suddenly came back up again. And it wasn't as disclosing, it wasn't as risk taking. And then you come back and the opposite. I, two, three times this happened. I thought, what is going on here that this one man can have this kind of influence so subtly without directing anything, just by his mere presence? So Sidney Gerard, I love this book. I had that, I still have this book, by the way. You'll hear why. So here I was, 24 years old, and I'm handed him his book and said, Professor Gerard, would you sign this? And he was a teacher at Tallahassee University, Florida, and uh, he signed it. And I said, I really want to write a book myself like this someday. He said, give me that book back. And he took the book and he said, Pat, if you never write that book, you have no one to blame but yourself. I said, I've still got it, and I, and I just finished that book. So if I was going to do a workshop here, let's say, you know, oftentimes I'll do a half a day, a full day workshop, I would say, have a whole bunch of different instruments to help you assess your lifestyle. And I do have some, I'm sorry, I didn't know how many were going to be here. Um, I'll pass those out at the end, some lifestyle assessments. And then if you don't get one, leave me your card and I'll email it to you. But like what you know, and that's kind of one of the beliefs I got at Edwards Georgia, your body knows what it needs. It knows what it needs to eat. It knows how it needs to move. Have you noticed that? Like when you've been a couch potato for a while, don't you get like stiff and achy and everything, right? Your body knows what it needs to do, but we don't always tune into that. So that part of body wisdom is kind of figuring out how do you tune into what your body needs and then how do you make sure that you do it. There's a, there's a huge emphasis on potential and desires. These are kind of a priority in the transhuman literature um, that, we, that we have sort of an obligation to fulfill our potential and to obtain our desires and that this is almost like a moral imperative. Um, to free the mind that we have a true self inside of us that's trapped by our human limitations and we need to figure out how to annihilate those limitations so that we can embody our true selves. So I was, the idea of wouldn't life be better, quality life be better without pain? Um, and so I thought, well, there, and I looked at this up, there is a rare neurological disorder called congenital insensitivity to pain. And people with this disorder do not feel pain or, or temperature. Right. But guess what? They don't do so well. They don't have any signal that says they're, they're, they're in harm's way. So they have more injuries, more, more serious illnesses that they didn't know, you know before they became that serious because they had no sensing device. So uh, my whole point here is that far from being the problem, pain could be the messenger that ultimately saves our life. That's physical. But I say it's also true emotionally, and this is that's, I'm using that kind of an analogy. 
the whole idea that I'm saying is emotional pain, even though we talk about negative, you know, people talk about negative emotions. I don't believe there is such a thing. That's a, that's a construct that we've applied to it. Uh, so I'm not, I'm saying it's not negative, but it is informative. It is crucial to speak and possibly cathartic to document one's experience and inner life. We also must speak when it is difficult to do so or when the unexpected or the tragic in life has plunged us into darkness. Sisu powerfully asserts, quote, the only book that is worth writing is the one we don't have the courage or the strength to write. The book that hurts us, we who are writing, that makes us tremble, redden, bleed, end quote. In the moments of bleakness, of total devastation, of being claimed by the horror of existence, these moments are perhaps some of the most important times to speak. To voice oneself explicitly, honestly, and without reservation. To confess, to witness the self. <laughs> when I'm a little more attuned than usual and a little less self-preoccupied like we all get, when I'm not lost in the time crush, rush to complete some task, whether superficial or authentic, the obvious can open and reveal intimate in infinite depths. My wife or daughter or son only have to walk into the room, and their very presence gives me an upwelling, an upwelling of love and gratitude. Sometimes they notice and ask why I'm smiling. And in those moments I say, you, just oh. simply you being here, that's all. And that's everything. And supported by their nourishment, I go on to offer as best I can, whatever I can, to this glorious and wounded and wounded world. One of the most heartening things for me in working with clients has been to uh, kind of observe the client going through the process of playing with the blocks and then having that, ah, aha, I get it, that aha moment of uh, when they finally arrive at it. I'm concerned that really without, with, when the examiner literally becomes a computer and the person's just turning things on the screen, that some of that interaction could really become lost. Um, another thing that goes along with that is, uh, especially when working with, uh, with children, uh, with maybe self-esteem or self-compassion concerns, also uh, old adults with intellectual disabilities who tend to uh, live with a lot of shame, embarrassment about their conditions, Oftentimes, those sort of success moments during a test can be a great moment therapeutically, transformative moment, to help the person recognize what they can do as opposed to getting hung up on what they can't do. I think that what this adds up to is if we really want to engage the next generation in the spirit of Chris Henry's sort of brief remark that he made in his presentation, it's incumbent upon us to retool our project and beginning to rethink our project in ways that bring it into alignment with the dominant forms of consciousness that are actually inhabiting our world, especially with respect to young people. I think this is vitally important. So I've been conducting, so that's the first part. So I've been conducting a three and a half year long experiment in seeing if I can start to do this. And my experiment has been to take the ideas and insights and thinkers and texts and vocabulary of humanistic psychology, of existential modes of psychology, precisely of phenomenology and Buddhist meditative forms of psychology, and see if I can give expression to them in the form of YouTube videos and see what happens if I do that. So um, this is my attempt to do that, and I have to sort of time things to see if I... I did plan to show you a video at this point that's only three minutes long, um, I'll go for it. Go for it. Could you expand that and show it, please? Turn the lights off. Hi. Following YouTube's suggestion, this short video will serve as an introduction to my channel. I remember you here, too, because you were very kind of military and, you know, like you said, you know, sort of arrogant and very black and white. And everyone else was like kind of do your own thing and lovey dovey and everything. And, but we needed you. And the fact that you, I mean, I, I can just feel Mike Aaron's here, like being so proud of you that you you were the one who was like the bridge from all those, you know, kind of wild hippies to, you know, that you could get people. He was training in Congress. He was training CEOs of, of major multinational corporations, and you made that happen, Daryl. So just like give him a round of applause. I mean, that oh, needs yeah. it. Let me go back to the Forrest Gump piece. A lot of a lot of incredible things happened, but honestly, I was a witness to it. I truly was. 